All right. Welcome to this session. The purpose of it is to, as it states here, to respond to the people who've been asking questions about the history of the Akbash dog and how it, how it came to the United States and Canada and uh, what was involved in the development of the breed and the recognition of it. And this is uh, based on uh, my own personal notes and experiences and many um, files left in correspondence from the Nelsons as well. This is just a simple reminder of um, where the uh, many of the Turkic peoples, which is a multiple, it's a multiple tribes and groups of people came from the east and swept uh, swept westward through uh, the Middle East, through, through the area that's now Turkey, formerly known as um, Asia Minor, and then on up into Europe. And they traveled its surmise with their hunting dogs, their guarding dogs, and their flocks of, of uh, livestock. Here's just a map of Turkey. It's a commonly reproduced one, and it shows us three areas. Around Eskashehir in western Turkey, south of Ankara, we see um, the heartland of the Akbash dog. In the middle of the country, in rougher ground, a different type of um, a lifestyle slightly, we find the Kongal dog. And that's very near the area called Sivas. So it used to be commonly called the Sivas Kongal dog. And then up closer to uh, the Russian border or what was Russia, Georgia, Armenia, we find the Kars dog up around Erzurum and just south of the Black Sea. There are some other, these are the three original regions and we're basing this really back on uh, statements by the Turks made in 1996 at an international symposium. We know there's the Malakli, um, which I, I, I am not here to define other breeds. These are three breeds that are established and widely accepted. So, how did we get the start with Akbash dogs? Well, in 1975 through 79, the Nelsons were attached to the US Embassy in Ankara. He worked for the State Department. Up at the top, you see the picture of the green grass or whatever crop and the sheep. That was taken right outside of a small village where they actually had a weekend cabin. And there that cabin is taken in, uh, that photo was taken in 2010. Um, and it's still there, although it's changed a bit. It used to have a big porch on it. And Judy is standing over there to the left in uh, pink pants, I think talking to some local people. This was a tiny enclave. It wasn't really a village. And what she said was what there in Balakdama, the name of this, uh, the closest village, they saw sheep and they saw dogs and they saw, they called them great white dogs. And soon they met Hilmi Anyon, who is a shepherd and he was actually their neighbor there in that tiny enclave. You see one of the dogs there, as you see the two dogs on the lower right, and the one in the foreground is called Akush, which translates to white bird. He is not really from Balakdama, but we'll meet him in a few minutes. So the Nelsons were both educated. She went to Smith and he went to, oh my gosh, I think it was Harvard. Uh, he was a geologist. She was actually in microbiology. They had had to leave their family pet at home. Their Dalmatian went to a family member when they moved to Turkey. They saw these magnificent white dogs, but they had questions like, are they just beautiful white dogs? Or is it really a breed? Does it reproduce itself? And they arranged a test mating using Hilmi's Jalon. 
Uh, they found an appropriate male. And something that quite surprised the, the Turkish people was they supplemented the female's diet. And they had a lit, large litter, which shocked um, their local people. They were quite surprised at the number of puppies. I don't know. Do they look like they're reproducing themselves? What do you think? That looks like a pretty successful test mating as far as dark pigment and white um, fur. From this test litter, the Nelsons took a puppy and they, they named her formerly Cybola, but they announced that when they put the puppy in the car, their youngest daughter, I think, or it could have been Kathy, one of the daughters announced, and we will name her Sheila. And so she became Sheila to the rest, to the, to the family. And there she is. She's quite sighthoundy. Um, and it soon they realized that these dogs were going to be an important part of their life. And they began outlining um, what to do with them because they were going to be returning to the U.S. So what they did, uh, Sheila was taken to another area. And here's the town if you want to look it up on the map. And she was bred. So she came carrying puppies in utero back to their, their home now in Maryland. So that was the beginning of um, the dogs in the US. At about that same time in 1979, um, remember what was happening. We were actually becoming environmentally more aware. Uh, we had had the publication of the book, The Silent Spring. So in the late 50s, in the 60s, into the 70s, there was a great concern with uh, poisoning of predators, um, the use of various uh, lethal practices when it came to wildlife. So there was a sudden interest in livestock protection dogs or livestock guard dogs. And here we see a photo. In 1979, the Nelsons actually took puppies to um, Washington, D.C. to a press conference where they were presented to the secretary, of Bob Berglund. And I'm going to, I dare say those two puppies looking at the timeline were probably um, Sheila puppies. So, and then by 1981, these, these dogs went out to the USSES, the US Sheep Experimental Station in Du Bois, Idaho. That was where most of the sheep research was being done <clears throat> and where they were using sheep on range with a variety of livestock guard dogs. They actually generated statistics comparing or data comparing different breeds. Nobody else has bothered to do that. We're all now doing research on crossbred dogs and just talking about livestock guard dogs in general, like you would talk about bird dogs in general, I guess, or hounds in general, instead of as separate breeds. In 81, the wildlife researchers out there who are now Dr. Jeff Green and Roger Woodruff, they're probably retired, they were giving very positive reports on these on the Akbash that they had. Annual trips had already become part of David Nelson's life and he traveled back and forth. Uh, and finally, he imported a total up until 96, he had imported, they had imported a total of 42 Akbash dogs out of the 50 total that came into the US and Canada. And this is an important point that um, I had repeatedly stressed to me when the Nelsons brought the dogs in and they saw how well they worked, they took a two pronged approach. That is they put dogs out on range with ranchers and they also tried to put them in companion dog homes and small farms, uh, more controlled situations. And why was that? Well, you see the asterisk there the high mortality of young ranch dogs. And I don't know, Crystal, I remember reading 
uh, that 18 months was the average age of a ranch dog. I don't know. I didn't go back and look to see if that was, if I could find that again, but do you have any comment to make about that? Yes, and actually I think it was, well, um, oh, that researcher, um, I'm, his mind isn't coming, his name isn't coming to mind. Um, he worked with the Coppingers a lot. He, uh, Lawrence. he did, hey, Lawrence. Yes, yes. Hey, yes. Uh, I think it was in 81 or 82, you know, 52% of the dogs were dying and most of it was before they were even 18 months old. Um, very few of the dogs reached three and five years old. Most of them, you know, just didn't live very long. So you can see then if we have 42 imports, how many of them, and a lot of those were going directly to ranchers. I knew several ranchers who actually got dogs directly um, imports sent directly to them. And then when they're not reproducing, you can see how in spite of all the numbers of imports, that's quite a few imports, um, but how many of them actually reproduced? And that was the problem. You'll notice in the asterisk also, it says this approach was not used with Congo dogs. David is one of the, was the first American to actually go into the Sivas area. And you have to remember, it was a rather controlled area back in the early 80s because of um, PKK activity. And in fact, the State Department and the military particularly didn't want any affiliated US citizens in that area to avoid any potential conflicts or disasters politically. Um, the, but when they began bringing back Congo dogs, they didn't put them out with ranchers. They took a much more controlled approach because they had learned a bitter lesson. Although that early use of Akbash is what gave us the reputation early on. Uh, Larry Allen here on your third bullet and Julie Hansmeyer uh, were two people that were involved from the earliest days using sheep. Larry was actually the first one to put dogs out with sheep. Uh, he has recently retired, and that's a loss for us. And Julie Hansmeyer is still very much um, working with her sheep and cattle and with the dogs. Any questions or comments at this point? All right, let's look. Success in the US. Uh, in 1986, the researchers published their results. You may have seen some of these. You can Google uh, USSES, LPDs, and find charts and information. Um, they had 399 producers, and they talked about the successes and failures of 763 livestock protection dogs. When they compared Akbash to the other white livestock protection, so that's Great Pyrenees, Kuvas, Marema, and they might have included Commodores in there. Akbash ranked high in staying with stock, in being aggressive toward predators, in tolerating people. In other words, they didn't bite the herders. One of the researchers made the comment that if the dogs bit the herders and the dog disappeared, the herder just said, I don't know, boss, he went down across that field and I never saw him again. Um, in 1990, they were, by 1990, they were recognized as one of the top three breeds for protection. And here we have a lovely photo from Becky Allen Loveless. Um, showing circle bar sheep moving pastures. And those are two of her children and two young herding dogs and two experienced Akbash back there making sure everything goes right. Hmm, success led to unpapered Akbash dogs. I think we're all aware of uh, the, the issue we have with unregistered dogs. At about 1982, a little after that, USSES decided they would no longer keep intact dogs. Um, I don't know if they were doing as the Turkish government facilities do and breed dogs and then provide them to ranchers. I have a feeling that's where a lot of their statistics came from, was they were producing some of their dogs. I do not know that. 
Um, but at any rate, the decision was made that the mission was changing and the breeding dogs would all be um, neutered or they needed to leave the, the um, sheep station. So one dog by the name of Pasha Bay that we'll see later was returned to the Nelsons. And Larry Shoup, who was an employee there, a researcher, left USSES and he went to New Mexico to the Hornado Experimental Range, which is sort of attached, I think, to New Mexico State University. And he took with him some intact Akbash dogs. And it's quite possibly they were imports that were unrelated to other dogs. He began breeding dogs there. They used them with their sheep. You can look up Hornada Range. Uh, they have lots of a long history of experimental ag research in very near desert conditions, very dry conditions. Um, I spoke to um, Dr. Shoup in 1996 and asked about his dogs. And he told me at that time that he had raised and sold over 500 puppies. Um, and whenever he needed another, he didn't register, he didn't spend money on that, didn't document the dogs, but whenever he needed males, we had already heard that he always went to Circle Bar or to Hans Meyers because he wanted purebred working dogs. So unpapered dogs. So in time, the JER dogs were taken, some of them were taken to NMSU's Corona Range Station, another area where they were used, running cattle, the running sheep, and they had quite a herd of uh, pronghorn antelope out there when we were there. Uh, they were used, the dogs there were used to protect the sheep. They were, they varied from three to five dogs. The bitches would whelp, they would give away the puppies. And a lot of uh, Texas and New Mexico, uh, even Colorado people knew about them and were, were, were eager to get their puppies. We worked with them and uh, the owners of the dogs from the, these two facilities and we were able to register a number of them. So when you look at your pedigrees, if you go back three, four, five generations, look for JER and Corona prefixes on the dogs and you can kind of see where they came from and what their history was. So in the meantime, while all of that's going on, the Nelsons in 82 through 82 to 85 were again transferred and attached to the embassy, this time in Belgium. They took with them four adult dogs. They took Cybola, Sheila, that we've already seen. They took Otto and um, they also had now had Pasha Bay and there he is back from the sheep station and a bitch called Kanjik who was specifically brought from Turkey to be a uh, potential breeding dog to, to introduce a new line because they had decided that the dogs were doing so well, they wanted to see, they wanted to continue breeding them. In 1984, the annual meeting for ADAI, and that was the first group, they, it was Akbash Dog Association International. So this was for imports, not, not simply the North American dogs, but I'm sorry, for exports into Belgium, England, Ireland. Um, there were a number of countries that had Akbash dogs. And in England, the Brits were very interested in the breed and they had a short-lived British Akbash dog club. Unfortunately, the Anatolian people had a fit and very soon the Akbash dog ceased to exist as a registered dog in, in the UK. Who were the officers at that time for that annual meeting? David Nelson, Ralph Yoey, who is Blue Yala, Judy Nelson, and David Sims and Arisha Davidiak. And those are names you may know. Um, Yoey is, has been dead for quite some time. Sims and Davidiak are the authors of one of the uh, two existing livestock guard dog book, training books. So let's kind of take a little left turn here and go down and talk about other Turkish dogs. Turkey's long been known for its population of pariah or street dogs, and in villages, they often fed at open dumps. And in fact, in the mid 
the in the 90s, and I do not remember if it was early or late, um, the, the town of Escachere, I believe it was, had poisoned the dump, attempting to get rid of pests, which were rats and skunk. Well, I don't know if they have skunks. That's a Texas pest, but all kinds of vermin and animals. And they also poisoned the majority of working dogs in that area. And it was an Akbash dog area. So that, that big die off of dogs really adversely affected um, the breeding potential that was there at, at that time. But that's, um, it, so we need to realize there is a large population. Other than those dogs happen to be centered uh, in uh, Akbash dog country and they belong to shepherds, but they would make trips into the dump to find treats. In Istanbul, in other villages where shepherding or particularly breeds of dog are not particularly bred or identified with as the local culture, you have all kinds of dogs. Um, and you have to remember, a lot of these dogs have, are Western breeds as well. German shepherds are often crossed into the livestock guarding dogs because the word shepherd dog translates only as livestock guard dog. The Turks have no herding breeds. So if it's a shepherd dog, it is a shepherd's helper, a shepherd's guard dog. Akbash dogs weren't the first dogs imported into the US. Uh, Catherine Braun has a wonderful interview in her book, The Uncommon Dog Breeds, with the importer of what became Anatolian Shepherds. Here's a little story. In 68, Lieutenant Ballard was stationed in Turkey and he had his car robbed and he went out looking for a guard dog. He wanted to protect his home and belongings. And he, as he tells it, he found a guard dog outside of Ankara in a village. And finally, before he and his family returned to California, they also found a female to go with them. So he had a pair of dogs. Here's the original. Whoops. Um, there's the original Zorba. And you can see this was the original Anatolian Shepherd. And here are two of his puppies. The puppies, the dogs were bred, the puppies were born, they were sold, and Nelson um, Ballard himself talks about they needed to make up a name and they needed to create a registry and a club so all the owners of the puppies could get together. And so thus, we came up with, he came up with, Anatolian Shepherds. Here is the probably higher ranking, but the one time Lieutenant Ballard. And this is the first Anatolian Shepherd Dog Club specialty, and he is winning with his Anatolian at that point. Um, new Blood was pretty much restricted to military people bringing back their family dogs or souvenir dogs, as some people call them. And they were kind of. Um, a decreasing population, but then by 1980, they realized there was a new source for dogs. The Anatolian Shepherd dog people be, uh, began buying registered Akbash dogs and they re-registered them as Anatolians. And I wonder how many people here that have Akbash today even know that. It was a very frustrating time in the 90s. <laughs> Here you go. Here's a paper. Anatolian Shepherd Dog Club of America. Right here in Texas, as a matter of fact. What do you notice? Whose name is this? There's Sheila. And there's Sheila again, bred to two different males. And they had puppies. Uh, Susa Bailey actually bought dogs directly from White Bird Kennels and then promptly transferred them into the Anatolian Shepherd Dog Club of America. So oh, when Anatolian people told me they had a dog that was wonderful with livestock and was perfect, they couldn't ask for anything better, I would just say, is it white 
or cream colored? And they'd say, how did you know? And I said, it's mostly Akbash. So that was a battle we fought. And it was very frustrating because people lied to get a hold of your dogs. In 1997, when UKC recognized the Congo dog, guess what? Akbash dogs no longer were the prize for the Anatolian shepherd dog people. They went after Congo dogs. So my sympathies for the Congo dog breeders. We've been there and we've done that. All right. One of the basic goals of the Nelsons and of our association is to really remind people that all Turkish livestock protection dogs are not a single breed. They, they aren't all Anatolian shepherds just divided by color. They have other real differences. Uh, publications, our researchers at USSES ranked Akbash dogs as more aggressive to predators and to other dogs, but less aggressive to people than were Anatolian shepherds. Tamara. Yes. Okay. Some, somewhat, we need to mute ourselves. Okay. Can everyone mute your screen? We're getting a lot of background information, of uh, background noise. All right. Is that better? Until someone's on. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so there were two kinds of people in the world at this point when you talked about Turkish dogs. There were lumpers who said that all Turkish dogs were one breed, or there were splitters. When, and when you think about it, Turkey, who these people said Turkey, just like even tiny Switzerland or like the UK, was home to multiple native breeds. The USSES researchers declared themselves in a magazine that they put out, a little a newsletter that went out to anyone who subscribed. They were splitters. They had seen enough difference between Anatolian behavior and Akbash dog behavior that they believed they were two different breeds. So that was kind of a important feather in the cap because that was one of our purposes to prove that these were actual um, different breeds. Data provided on Anatolian shepherd dog behavior from Hampshire College's farm center, and that was Ray Coppinger, who is credited by Wikipedia for popularizing the Anatolian shepherd in the US. I thought that was pretty amazing. The, the behavior that was provided, the data that was provided by the Farm Center to USDA that was incorporated into these studies wasn't reflected in the rancher's reports back to USDA. So later in the early 90s, there was a small project triggered to reevaluate ASD behavior it also, they included 20 Anatolian shepherd dogs and 20 pure Akbash dogs. The report in this small research project, it was such a small number of animals, the data wasn't considered super valid for science purposes, but the reports back from the ranchers were that 72% of the Anatolians killed or maimed their sheep 28% of the Akbash dogs did so. And that was via phone call in 1996 with, where um, when I was doing research, getting ready to go to a symposium that you'll find out about in a minute. Now, that was in 1994. And at that time, the Anatolian breed had a very mixed back, background. It had originally been purchased as a guard dog, a family guard dog to bite people if they came in and weren't, weren't welcome. So um, that doesn't mean that it's the same breed today, but there is the background. Then, so we had another breed, the Anatolian, but we also suddenly had another registry. In 1984, here are the officers, and we've already seen that. In 1985, we have letters showing the, the uh, Nelsons who were still in Belgium at the time, sending 
um, articles and documents back to, to go into the bulletin, which um, the editors, David Sims and his wife, Arisha Davidiak, were putting together. It was quite convenient because they had the mailing list of all Akbash Dog Association International slash Akbash Dog Association of America members. So in 86, they announced the formation of a new registry. And there is the vice president and the two editors. And they said they wanted to focus on working dogs. Now, whose dogs had been out at USSES? Um, they broke away from the Nelsons and personality conflicts are certainly a, a, a high probability there. <clears throat> And ironically, they took their Nelson bred dogs or Nelson imported dogs and put them all into their new registry. They often changed the name. So the name White Bird on a dog became Blue Yala, which is Yoey's name, or White Bird on a dog became Odessa Farms, which was Sims and Davidiak. The splinter group is called Akbash Dogs International, rather close to the original name of our organization. So have you, anyway, let's go on. So just as a historical fact, that group itself, here are some of the, here are some of the, um, kennel names, farm names, when you look at your pedigrees, you can look at this and kind of know where these animals came from and the stories behind them. Uh, Ralph Yoey, now deceased, was Blue Yala. The Canadian uh, Sims and Davidiac were Odessa Farms. They also, they formed ADI with breeders such as Anita Drobrzewski, Hindisu was her kennel name. Uh, Diane Spizak was Sheepfields, Hurriet was Marsha Peterson, and um, Brem, Maurice Brem for, um, had the kennel name Bremont. So those names were given to most of the ADI registered dogs or many of the ADI registered dogs. It didn't take very long. The splitters began infighting and they split themselves. One of them folded in the mid 90s. Uh, the other one is still in existence. And as for ADAA, um, the existence of a separate international section of ADAA was no longer needed. So ADAA which is our current association, we just took over the functions of ADAI, um, deciding that international registry could be done by us as well as anybody else. The more the merrier, unless the pedigrees are false. Remember, when the new registry formed, they were very proud of their kennel names and their new organization. So, in 1997, we became affiliated with UKC and they recommended against blanket refusal to register qualified Akbash dogs with no OFA or pin hip scores. In other words, the dogs didn't need a score to be registered. We discussed that. We discussed it because we knew that ADI had already begun requiring pin hip or OFA evaluations for permanent registry. The issue we have seen, and we were warned by UKC, the people we were working with who were advising us as we became the National Breed Club, it's possible to have multiple generations that are purebred dogs that qualify and may very well have excellent hips, but they haven't been officially evaluated. And that's really true when you talk about working dogs and range dogs. The other thing that we, um, ADAA set as a goal was to encourage the registration of all qualified Akbash dogs. We see unpapered dogs as a threat to the breed because people will go off and breed those dogs and pretty soon you've got whatever they've upgraded, they've bred to, 
will have a lot of the traits that we value in the pure Akbash. For ADAA, um, and I got ahead of myself with pedigrees being falsified, and, 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 um, but here we are. We require a prefix or suffix indicating the breeder if possible, either the breeder or the owner. And we allow no name changes once a dog is registered. UKC allows no name changes once the dog has registered offspring. You can imagine if you have one dog in a pedigree, in this pedigree it has one name, and in this pedigree it has another name, you can see how those pedigrees are false and useless. ADI, we discovered, had a, has a history of changing names of previously registered dogs. And we saw that, as I referred earlier to that pride they have when they formed their own association, they didn't want to have white bird dogs anymore. They didn't want to have dogs with known ADAA breeder names on them. So an example, the registered import Alp Arslan white bird became Alp Arslan of Blue Yala. And that's just to name only the most recent case I know of in 221, where puppies were being registered with UKC using Blue Yala and the dog wasn't registered. And then lo and behold, the, the person who used the semen from this dog discovered his original name and the one in UKC was White Bird. So this is one of the um, sticking points that we often have with the other registry. Um, it is important to keep our pedigrees correct if we're going to use them at all. In 96, there was a big change. We didn't quite realize how big it was going to be. Uh, I've already made references to UKC, but remember in 1996, it was just ADAA and ADI, individual little standalone private organizations registering breed, the, the Akbash dog breed. In 1996, an international symposium on Turkish shepherd dogs was held in Konya, Turkey. And people who attended, if, if you don't know David Serpel, you need to. Um, Jeff Green was one of our researchers, um, a woman very active in trying to differentiate Karabash, Congol dogs from Anatolians in England, and Ray Coppinger from the um, Hampshire Farm Center. And also invited were David Nelson and myself, and we all addressed the, the um, audience there. Okay, we'll speak now. Not speaking in your ears. Someone needs to mute their phone. Yeah, I think I just muted them. I think you can go okay. over there and mute them. Um, the proceedings were published and they included a letter that the then of the then Turkish stance on their native breeds, which no kennel club in the world accepted. No one accepted the Turkish definition of breeds, except the Akbash Dog Association, the Nelsons accepted it because they knew they had experience with Akbash, Kongol, Cars, and Tazi. There was no such breed as the Anatolian Shepherd listed in that letter. And just a side note, Coppinger's paper in the proceedings, if you open this book up and read his paper, it talks all about Anatolians. But when he spoke to that Turkish audience, he always said the word Kongol dog. I admired his ability to change it every single time. What happened? UKC and AKC both got the letter stating where the Turks stood on their breeds and what breeds they recognized. UKC immediately contacted ADAA and the KDCA. They said, we have recognized Anatolians. We did not know. We did not know the controversy. And we have, we somewhat regret that. Oh, that was a personal communication. Um, 
there were people active in both of these registries in the Akbash dog and the Congal dog. We got the Congal dog to find out if it was really just, they're all the same and the Congal is acts like an Akbash, but it's a different color. We found out they were different breeds. And so a lot of people or a number of people showed both Akbash and Congal dogs. They wanted to prove that Akbash did not equal Congal, did not equal Anatolian. And the judges kind of sat up and paid attention when they saw two very different breeds showing and being consistent in their separate breed groups. And then here came in the Anatolians, which could have been any of those. After the symposium, we got the invitation to join uh, UKC. Both clubs readily took it on and agreed to that this would benefit the breed and the clubs. In 1998, um, Akbash, as well as Congal, were recognized by UKC and were eligible for UKC events. This is the year before we had an exhibit and there's Judy Nelson, Connie Hankins, who no longer raises dogs, myself, Cindy Cook, who became our patron saint with UKC, and Nancy Ricks, um, now deceased, a very, very important person in the early years, and the Arba champion, because we had no breed club, no way to show. Our ak Akbash often showed in the American Rare Breed Association. He was an Arba champion, and he became UKC's first Akbash dog champion. We've had generated a poster and uh, we're presenting that to Cindy Cook out of appreciation for her work. That was our first exhibit. And actually, I guess it was in 98 to provide. And the reason we were there was so that the judges could come over and we probably had four or five different Akbash dogs and they could come over and meet the Akbash because none of them really knew what they were. So we jump forward. That's been a long time ago. And we were recognized in 1998. We've been the National Breed Club ever since. We've shown in uh, at UKC shows. In 2010, Judy Nelson uh, and I decided to go back to Turkey. And when we did, we went to Konya. And there is a reunion of the people who were so important in that first 1996 symposium with myself and Judy, Dr. Joffrey Tepoli. He was a young undergraduate, a young graduate student, and this was his master's project was that international symposium. His advisor, Orhan Chetan, and Dr. Chinap Tekenshin, the man who put pencil to paper and defined what the Turkish native breeds were. Um, I regret I don't have a copy of that. I have it somewhere in my files, but uh, the Congo Dog people have certainly posted it multiple times on the internet as well. So it was a really pleasant reunion. Everybody's a little older and um, wiser, I guess. But the real reason to go in 2010 was for Judy and I to, re, to, to go back and see Balak Dhamma again, to see Sivrisar, but to also attend the Akbash Dog National Festival. And here is their banner outside the breeding facility near in Sivrisar, just a few miles from Balak Dhamma, that little tiny enclave where Judy first saw the magnificent white dogs. Prior to the exhibit, the director of the Sivrisar Akbash Dog Breeding Program facility spoke, and he cited the importance of the Nelsons in revitalizing interest in that area, and we were quite shocked. Judy heard the word Nelson in the middle of all of this Turkish, and she quickly turned to someone sitting next to her and said, what is he saying? It turned out that David, posthumously, Judy and myself were given awards of appreciation from the Turkish Akbash Dog Association for, the, for, they said, our decades of promoting the dogs, both in Turkey and the US. 
And in a moment, you'll see a little bit of how that promotion was done when uh, we traveled to Turkey. Remember, in the 90s, the Congo dog became the prestigious dog to have, much like Rin Tin Tin after the World War. Everyone at Body wanted Rin Tin Tin. Well, Akbash dogs kind of suffered from that. There was a Congo mania, as Judy called it, in the mid 90s in um, Turkey. Here were some of the dogs at the festival. Interesting. Now you can, uh, let's see, do we have anyone? So who's your favorite? This is a female. And this is a female. We have some variation in the breed. And I think we have that same variation here. This I thought you would enjoy seeing is the um, how the dogs are being evaluated. The judges are going down the line, looking at them, checking. You'll notice they're wearing their Sunday best collars. Red felt is used underneath these metal collars to keep the, the, the iron from um, scratching the necks. This dog has a beaded collar in typical Turkish colors. We didn't know what we had. There at the festival, when people realized that Judy Nelson was there, it was very interesting. One man came up to us and pulled out a newspaper and he translated, or someone next the people we were with translated it for us. We didn't know what we had until this American reminded us. It told the story of the white haired Americans searching for Akbash dogs and exporting them to the US and Europe for over two decades, while constantly encouraging the preservation of the breed in Turkey. And then a guy shows up and he lays out two Polaroid pictures, very old Polaroid pictures. And he said, David Nelson hired me to find him Akbash dogs and then take care of them until he returned to the US. We found three excellent dogs. He took only two. He gave me a beautiful female that I could not afford to buy. He told me, take care of her and next time he would buy puppies from me. He was truly a friend to Turkish shepherds and Akbash dogs. That is promotion of a breed. That and always when you traveled to Turkey, if there was any National Geographic, wool growers, um, rangelands magazine that had an Akbash dog on the cover or inside photo and pictured, you took multiple copies of that magazine and you gave it to mayors in these little towns in these villages so they could point to it and say see these are our Akbash dog in America. You gave it to the deans that you met in the university if they were had anything at all to do with the veterinary school or with dogs or with sheep. And it was just a constant um, reminder to the Turks of what a wonderful breed they had. And um, Kongles are great they're not the end all and be all. Today we're recognized by UKC. We're included in shows across the country. The shows just allow us to get our working dogs out. In UKC, professional handlers are banned and dog shows are a family sport. They provide a way for Akbash dogs, people to meet each other and to see each other's dogs while we're still educating the public. And there's a photo of our um, 2020, uh, 2021 dogs at the national specialty. And I hope we got names correct. <laughs> um, and, and actually that kind of summarizes what our goal was to have the dogs recognized as a separate breed publicly, to have multi-generational pedigrees and to have a body of people supporting the breed and providing them for particularly our ranchers and um, our people concerned with predation control. 
Today, we've got more means of communication than ever, bulletins, Facebook pages, annual meetings, Zoom meetings, such as this one, and shows where Akbash dogs are still a very rare sight. And we also have our DNA interrelatedness project going on to trying to establish a genetic profile of the breed and be able to plan matings, exam maximizing genetic diversity. Maybe someday we'll actually be able to DNA test something and say, it pretty much looks like it's a real Akbash dog. You can't do it yet though. ADA is the National Breed Club, approves dogs from non-UKC parents. And that's important. That helps us to trace down dogs whose paperwork has been lost, as long as we can establish a trail. This open stud book helps to ensure a healthy future for this breed. And in, included in that uh, approving is also imported dogs. As today, we have more imported dogs than we have had in many years. And that brings us to the conclusion of our Zoom meeting. I would, do we have questions or comments? And you can unmute yourselves. <laughs> Anybody? Was there one interesting thing here? I think that one of the really interesting things on this was just the politics that went on getting us to the point where we're at today. I don't think any of us realized just how much of that actually went back and forth early on. Um, yeah, it's we really are smooth sailing. We we don't we still inquire like if we're selling a puppy, we try to, I think a lot of us kind of have learned to visit with them. We don't want people buying our purebred dogs and breeding, upgrading their crossbred dogs, but we don't have people lying and trying to grab our dogs and put them into the Anatolian registry like they used to. That's happening with the Congo dogs. I, I, I've had someone do that with one of my Congo dogs not very, you know, more recently than the Akbash, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you point that out. Um, anybody else, anything interesting there? Charlie just asked a question. Um, okay. uh, is it true that no more Akbash dolls can be exported from Turkey? My understanding back until the early 90s, there was a law on the books um, that you could export native species, bird, plant, mammal, whatever, if it doing so would enhance the reputation of Turkey and the Turkish culture. That law changed in I'd say the late 90s and all native species, bird, plant, mammal, were forbidden to be exported. And to my knowledge, that is still the case now. What's the secret? The secret is Anatolian shepherds are not a breed in Turkey. Dogs that are coming out of Turkey are very often coming out with health papers stating they're Anatolian shepherds. Well, that's like me saying, uh, I've got a Texas cow dog. It's not a breed. It's a generic label. So that's Charlie is um, how I think they're bringing dogs out. So any other questions or comments? Kathy, yes. Kathy, Kathy Nelson is wanting to say something, I think. Yes, Kathy. Hi, Crystal. Thank you. Hi, Tamara. Thank Hi. you so much. This was wonderful. This was just the most amazing presentation on everyone's work, your work and my parents' work. And I just want to say on behalf of my family, we really appreciate it. Thank you. It was really outstanding. And I'm I'm just about in tears 
knowing about the man with the Polaroid coming up and explaining how he obtained those Polaroids and that story. Um, truly, it, it, it really speaks to the passion my parents both had about this breed. Yeah, and, and the ultimate, re the absolute respect they treated um, the Turkish shepherd. <clears throat> it didn't matter who they were dealing with. They were treated with great respect and um, they were encouraged, you know, in their endeavors. So I'm yeah. glad you were able to see this. I thought of you while I was putting that together. Uh, <laughs> I had to really dig to find those photos. I thought I'd lost them all. But anyway, I hope other people enjoyed that a little bit. It got a little, it, it, you know, if you don't know these people, um, it might be a little boring, but hopefully it's part of your history if you have Akbash. Anybody else? How did you like the dogs at the, um, at the, at the uh, exhibition? I thought they were really interesting, Tamara. Um, and it was great to see pictures of my mother there and, and you there. Um, I can remember back in 2010, myself, my husband and my two kids, we were leaving Brussels. We were in the middle of moving and I wanted so badly to be able to join both of you on this trip. Yeah. And it was just impossible because of the way uh, the dates and the move, we were literally moving within a week and I had movers in my house. So, um, you know, it was like, it feels like a missed opportunity for me, but at the same time, it's wonderful to see the pictures and your pictures together and to hear the stories and um, things that went on. So I, I feel like we've got that preserved well now. Um, it's really fantastic.